Is a false negative stress test really a great way to die? That sounds sort of like a confusing statement followed by clickbait. Unfortunately, uh, clickbait to me is something that really doesn't have much meaning and it's not in the video. Well, this has meaning. People die from it all the time. So I recently did a video on uh, the death of Tim Russert. His was one of the more recent examples of how you can have a totally negative stress test. The patient feels such relief. Oh, I'm fine. I'm good now. And then dies a couple of weeks, a couple of months later. In Russert's case, it was six weeks later. Now, why did this happen? It was a ruptured plaque that ended his life. You know, Russert, in, in case you don't remember him, he was very, the very popular host of Meet the Press. He was very passionate about doing research, and one of his quotes was, the highest purpose of the press is to hold government accountable. So he was really good at, at finding old clips of high-profile government officials that were not consistent with their current activities and then ask them to respond to that in front of the press, in front of the cameras. So America enjoyed watching their favorite love-to-hate politician squirm in front of the cameras. The New York Times said his docs, when they were interviewed, didn't know he had plaque. That's not true. He, they knew he had plaque, and so did he. He had a positive coronary uh, calcium score, a score of 210, in 1998, 10 years before he died. Uh, Dr. Michael Newman, his internist, and Dr. George Brin were interviewed, and they did say, though, the autopsy showed a surprising amount of plaque. So why didn't they know about that plaque? Here's a very cogent point that was made by someone else who's a cardiologist, obviously very concerned about this issue. It was Carl Levy in the Oxner, Re Oxner Review. He said, Given that he passed the stress test six weeks before, the plaque in his LAD, left anterior descending, probably never exceeded 50%. Now, what does that mean, and why did he say that? Well, that's a, it's a well-known fact for cardiologists, but maybe not so well-known among patients, or they wouldn't be asking for stress tests so much. This is from the Princeton Longevity Institute. And it makes a really good point about my question, which I'll get to in a minute. So if you're doing a stress test, in order to get a positive stress test, you have to have over 50% plaque occlusion of the artery. In other words, this little red thing where the, the blood is flowing is down to less than 50%. Well, most heart attacks, as in 68% of them, occur in people with less than 50% occlusion. So, that brings up the question, why are we still doing stress tests? There are few, many people have had many ideas. Atul Gawande uh, put a lot of this, started a lot of this uh, in his article in the New Yorker magazine, 2009, The Cost Conundrum. Basically, he's saying docs see patients as a cash machine. And there was truth, especially in, in McAllen, Texas, the highest cost for Medicare in the country. And it looked like it was the highest cost for Medicare in the country and the lowest uh, per capita income. Uh, docs were treating patients like a cash machine. But even Gawande said this, and I know, I know that's true. We all know that sometimes that's true. But I've made a, a living out of supervising docs, and I can tell you docs are like people. Some are good, some are bad. Most of them got into it because they wanted to help. So you see this little quote up here? I think this becomes an issue more and more and more when we're looking at this problem. When there are multiple solutions to the same problem, it's because none of them really work. How many solutions are there to finding a risk for a heart attack? There's four types of stress tests alone. The stress EKG, stress echo, nuclear stress test, and a drug-induced stress test. Why all the different ones? Drug-induced stress test, you could say, is for a different problem. 
but the other three just don't work, as we just saw. But I don't think it's because uh, docs, I don't think it's necessarily because docs are seeing patients as a cash machine. As I said, some are. Here's the issue. Docs want to help. And when there's a serious problem, they seriously want to help. And what kind of problem is more serious than prediction and preventing a heart attack? Thank you for your interest. My name is Ford Brewer. I started off as an ER doc, became, became very frustrated with the fact that most things that bring people into the ER were preventable, like heart attack and stroke. I went to Johns Hopkins to get training and ended up running the program there in prevention. There I trained dozens of docs, and again, that was three decades ago. Since then, I've trained thousands of docs, and even more importantly, um, supervised those docs, and even most importantly, helped thousands of patients prevent things like heart attack and stroke. Uh, waiting for, a, for the disease and hoping for a cure for this kind of devastation doesn't work. Come to uh, Louisville, no, November 8th and 9th. We have a boot camp type of environment for two days where you learn all the things that you didn't learn from your doc in terms of heart attack, stroke prevention, things like cardiovascular inflammation, how to detect it, how to measure it, things like uh, insulin resistance, the number one cause of inflammation, how to detect it, how to measure it, how to stop it, how to manage it. You also get, um, you can get the labs there if, um, for that event if you'd like and get a complete evaluation. In addition, you get an arterial scan called a CIMT. To get the right one of those is fairly difficult. So I'm looking forward to seeing you there. Thanks.